Good morning, good afternoon everyone! In this new Unity tutorial, we're going to see how to create a basic day and night cycle system for a little 2D RTS game. In the end, we'll have this overall change in the global lighting of the scene as time goes by, and we'll also integrate little spots on buildings and units to better highlight them at night. Finally, we will keep track of the current hour of the day with this clock in the top right corner of the UI. Note that in this episode, I'll start from the Unity project where I implemented my RTS Collector AI, so that I already have some nice assets to try my system on. So if you're curious to see how I prepared this level, and how I gave my little trucks this simple gather and deliver logic for wood and minerals, you can either check out the video I made on this topic, or just go ahead and get the assets directly from the GitHub. Alright, and with all that said, let's get to it and discover how our day and night cycle will work. Okay, to begin with, we're going to discuss a bit how the system will be set up. In this tutorial, I'm going to rely on a set of time marks that define the different parts of the day. For example, for now, I'll say that I have a first mark in the morning, another for the late afternoon, and a third one for night time. Each mark will correspond to a specific color and a specific intensity for the global light in our scene, which will make it easy to tint the entire level and give it a particular atmosphere. Although one day is 24 hours, we're going to normalize the time mark's position and say that they go from 0 in the morning to 1 at the other end of the cycle. And because the cycle loops, D1 will actually be at the same place, only on the other side. To handle all of this, let's go to our Unity editor and create a new c -sharp script, day and night cycle.cs. Then we'll place it on the manager game object in our scene, which already has some scripts we discussed in the last episode, and open it in our IDE. First of all, we'll prepare a data structure for time marks. This struct will contain three fields, the normalized time ratio for this mark in the 0-1 range, and the color and the intensity we want the global light to have at this moment of the day. Now that we have this new type, we can create an array of marks in our class, and expose it in the inspector, and then fill our data in the editor. Because we have normalized all the time data, we also need to keep track of how long the cycle should actually be. We'll do that with a new float variable, cycle length, that represents the total duration of the cycle, from morning to morning, in seconds. We can give it a default value of 24 to get somewhat relatable timestamps, but during this first test, don't hesitate to bring it down to a lower number to have the whole cycle go by quicker. Okay, with this data ready, let's work on the cycling logic per se. The idea here will be to have some indices for the current and upcoming marks, and update those regularly whenever we pass a mark in our array. So we'll also need a variable to hold the current time that has elapsed in this cycle, and some extra variables for the exact time in seconds for the current and the next markers. These values will be useful to compare with the current cycle time variable, so that we can know if we've just passed a mark or not. To initialize all of this, we will set the current mark index to minus 1 and then call a new function in our script called cycleMarks. This method will increment the current mark index, but with a modulo to ensure it doesn't overshoot the length of the marks array. So basically, if the index reaches the end of the array, this will just wrap it back to zero. We will then do something similar for the next mark index by taking our current mark index plus 1 modulo the length of the marks array. And finally, we will use these two indices to get back the actual day and night mark objects from the array and store the actual time in the cycle in seconds. We can get this value easily just by multiplying the normalized time ratio of the mark by the total length of the cycle. The next step is to use the update method of our class to run some logic every frame. More precisely, what we want to do is increment the current cycle time variable by the time.deltaTime built-in value, which is the time that has passed since the last frame. So this operation will effectively have our current cycle time variable count the total time that has elapsed since the game has started. To have it wrap back to zero when a cycle ends, we can once again use a modulo based on the cycle length variable. Finally, to check if we've passed a mark, 
We want to compare this updated current cycle time variable with the time in seconds of the next mark, which we stored in the next mark time variable. The problem is that sadly we can't just do an equality check like this. Because floats have lots of decimals and are subject to approximations, asking Unity for an exact equality like this will usually fail, and will basically jump over the mark without even noticing it. To avoid this issue, the trick is to rather compute the difference between our two values and check that this difference is less than a given threshold. I'll use a constant value of 0.1 seconds, because I know that my marks are spaced enough for this to not cause any collisions, but if you happen to have marks closer together, you might need to play around with this value and see what is best for your project. Anyway, if we do get this case, it means that we have reached a mark, and that we should therefore apply its color and intensity to the global light in our scene, and cycle to the next couple of current and next marks in our array. So we'll create a new reference to an object of type light2d in our scene. Be sure to import the unity.rendering.universal package so that you can access this class, and expose the variable in the inspector, and then just drag the global 2D light of your scene in the slot. Now back in our day and night cycle script, we'll get the data of the mark we just reached, which is still stored in the next mark index at this point, and apply its color and intensity values to the light. Then we'll simply call our cycle marks function. And here we are. If we enter play mode now, we see that we start with our morning settings, then after a while we switch to the late afternoon and the night, and then finally we come back to a new day in the morning, and so on and so on. That's pretty cool, but of course, these sudden changes are a bit harsh. So let's see how to animate the global light to have it go from one state to the other more gradually. Okay, now that we have these time marks in place, we need to have our day and night system actually transition from one to the other, to have continuous and smooth changes. So instead of just instantly updating our values like this, we'll want to also gradually modify the color and the intensity of our global light over time to match the upcoming time mark. This process of blending between two extreme values is called lerping, and we usually do it on a renormalized scale, by considering our start value like 0 and our end value like 1, and then sliding an interpolation parameter t in between. In our case, we'll want to lerp both the color and the intensity of the global light every frame to have the whole lighting evolve slowly through the time marks. Basically, this means that we want to extend our update method with a bit of code that gets the current and the next marks, and then blends the color with color.lerp and the intensity with matf.lerp to get these interpolated values. The only issue here is that we haven't actually defined our parameter t. So what exactly is this equal to? Well, we know that this parameter should be 0 when our cycle time is at the current mark, and 1 when it is at the next mark, just before we cycle through our marks and update the current and next references. This parameter t is therefore the difference between the current cycle time and the current mark time, renormalized by this total duration between the two marks. To get this duration, we can simply take the difference between the next and the current mark times in most cases. However, when we reach the end of the cycle, we have to be careful because this computation will give us a negative duration and completely crash the lerping process. So if we have reached the last mark in the cycle, and this is negative, we need to re-add the cycle length to this duration to get back a positive number. And now all that's left to do is back in the update, define our t parameter as the difference between the current cycle time and the current mark time, divided by this new marks time difference. And that's it! If we restart the game now, we see that our global light now blends smoothly between our time marks and creates a nice atmosphere for the scene. But actually, because of this new slow lerping, the night doesn't stay completely dark for very long, because the light fairly quickly crawls back to an intensity of 1. So if you want to keep a chunk of your cycle really dark, you can cheat a little and add a new mark in the day and night cycle component inspector near the end, at a normalized time of 0.9 for example, with the same blue color and a similar intensity. 
This will force the global light to stay quite dim all the way through this late mark in our cycle, and then make a quick morning wake up animation where the light suddenly comes back along with the normal colors. The thing is that during this long chunk of night, when the light's intensity drops to 0.4 or so, it's pretty hard to see what's actually happening on screen. So to fix this, let's see how to add some nice spotlights on our buildings and units to have them stand out in the dark. The core mechanics of our day and night cycle are ready, but it's time to do a bit of extra setup in our scene to help the players see the trucks and the buildings in the night. So suppose I create a new 2D spotlight in my scene and bring it to the position of my main building in the center. I will increase its outer radius up to 2 so it covers a larger area, and then boost its intensity slightly by reducing its falloff parameter to 0.4. As you can see, this light is pretty ugly at the moment. It makes a big overexposed zone in our level that just makes everything whitish. That's because since we also have the global light that impacts the entire scene, this specific zone receives way more energy than the rest, and the pixels are forced to a super exposed value. You can actually check this out by temporarily disabling the global light. If you do, the lighting in this area will be back to normal with OK colors and no overexposure. Except that, of course, now the rest of the level is entirely black. So at this point, you might be thinking that we're gonna have to code some logic to turn our spotlights on and off so that when we are in the daytime and the global light is on, we don't have this bad overexposure. But luckily, Unity Study Lights have something up their sleeve to help us solve this issue way faster. The Overlap Operation Mode. If you come back to a new 2D spotlight, you see that its inspector contains a section titled Blending, with various parameters. These are the different options Unity provides us with for mixing this 2D light with the other ones in the scene. The Overlap Operation parameter can take two values, Additive or Alpha Blend. By default, it is in additive mode, which is why the area with both the global light and the spotlight receives all this energy and is overexposed. The alpha blend mode basically allows us to blend the lights together based on their alpha values, which in particular means that you can completely overwrite one of the other if you want. This is very useful in our case, since as you can see, as soon as we turn this mode on, the spotlight is eaten up by the global light. And even better, if we come back to the global light properties and reduce its intensity, we see that the spotlight is still there, and reappears slowly as the global light gets dimmer and dimmer. So this overlap operation does exactly what we want, and we can now copy our spotlight to the few other locations or units we want to eliminate in the night. And then, if you try it out, you see that, as expected, as long as the global light has a high intensity, the spotlights are invisible. And then, as soon as the light starts to dim, the spots begin to appear and gradually stand out more as the intensity of the global light reduces further. So that's it, we don't have to do anything else for this part because just setting the right overlap operation took care of everything for us. There is, however, a little bonus feature we can implement. The regular update of a clock in our UI to tell the players which time it is exactly in the game. To wrap up this tutorial, we are going to implement a bit of extra logic to have our UI show a clock with the current time of the day in the game in hours. The actual update of the clock label in the UI canvas will be handled by your UI manager, which will react to an event from a global event manager system. I've already discussed this in more details in the previous episode on the RTS Collector AI, and in this video about how to set up events and messaging in Unity. In short, thanks to this event manager component on our manager object, we'll be able to trigger and listen to global events throughout the scene, which helps completely decouple the systems but still ensures they can talk to each other. So let's go back to our day and night cycle script and in the start method start a new coroutine, updating time, that regularly sends this event, called timeset, with a formatted string containing the current in-game time in hours. The coroutine will execute endlessly, thanks to this infinite while loop, and it will pause for a while between each event trigger. 
The delay is the length of one hour in our game, which can be computed as shown here, since we've said that the cycle length is the total duration of one cycle, i.e. 24 hours. In the getFormattedTime method, we'll want to convert our current cycle time float variable to a nice string of the form 01h, for example. To get the current time in hours, we just have to compute the ratio of our current cycle time over the total cycle length, and then remultiply this by 24. Then, thanks to the c string interpolation utilities, we can easily format our number to always be in two digits with an optional zero prefix, and add the h character at the end. We'll also trigger the event with a call to this function at the very beginning of the game, in the start method, so that the UI is properly initialized. The problem is that for now, our first cycle mark is matched to 0, zero hours, even though we set it up to be the morning. This means that night will fall around 10 am, which is quite counterintuitive and unrealistic. So let's add one final improvement to our system and expose a new variable in our day and night cycle class the start hour, so that we can define at what time of the day in hours we want our first mark to be. I'll set its default to 8am, and then back in my getFormattedTime function, I'll simply add this offset to my hours variable, and rewrap it properly with the modulo on 24. And voila! We have now successfully implemented a basic day and night cycle system, which lets us easily define some time marks in a normalized scale, blends the color and the intensity of the global 2D light accordingly all throughout the day, and optionally brings up some 2D spotlights if this intensity gets too low. We even added a simple clock display in our UI to help players keep track of the current time in-game. So there you go, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this quick tutorial and that you learned a few things. If you did, feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel, and of course, if you have other ideas of Unity tricks that you'd like to learn, don't hesitate to leave a comment. As always, thanks a lot for watching, and take care.